Okay, we're going to go ahead and uh, get started. We have a few people online as well. Um, I'm Patrick Matthews. I'm the general manager uh, with Salinas Valley Recycles. And uh, this is the scoping meeting for our long-term facility needs study. Um, so I'm going to actually turn it over to uh, Jeff Zimmerman from ACOM. But before we do that, I just want to let everybody know, because we have people on the web uh, webinar, uh, anybody uh, listening in uh, at their computers, if you have questions, please type them in the uh, chat section, and at the end of the presentation, uh, we'll endeavor to uh, uh, consider those questions either uh, through a, a written response at a later point, or if it's something simple we can answer, we'll do that at the end of the meeting. Jeff? Okay. All right. Well, as I mentioned, I'm Jeff Zimmerman. I'm with a company called ACOM, and we're working for the authority on preparing this uh, environmental impact report that will be done on this facility that we're about to go through the slide presentation on. Um, so we've got basically a brief slide presentation that we'll go through. We have also some boards that the, the authority has prepared that are part of the study that we'll have, and you've seen them in the materials that we've handed out um, on that. So we'll have a chance to, after I think the formal presentation, to take a look at those closer and ask questions and bring them up. Um, so I'll start off on this, uh, we'll go through a little introductory type material on here. Let's see if I can get this. This is, uh, is it? let's see, one of those works. Let's see. As soon as we figure out how to do it. Oh, you can just use the key. Oh, that's easier. So what did you do to it? Uh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, well, just to start off with the authorities, um, the Salinas Valley uh, Solid Waste Authority is responsible for the long-term waste management and uh, uh, disposal and resource recovery, um, and that's what this project is is all about. Uh, over the years, as many of you know, the authority has been looking at developing a new site, new facility or combination of facilities and sites that can handle the long-term needs of the authority over time. And we're going to go over the options that, that we have uh, that we consider to date. And these will involve either, as I mentioned, a single site or a multiple hybrid of sites and facility types on that. And that's what this process is, is going to determine over time. So let's see. Thank you. Um, so there's some regulatory, the situation in California has changed over time. Uh, there's a lot more emphasis. I won't go into the details on each of these things that are available to look at, but uh, there's been a lot more um, incentive as well as, uh, 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 I guess, a requirements to um, uh, reuse and recycle and, and meet different goals that the state has on this, and that's been uh, motivating the, the types of facilities that handle this material and recovery of this material. And so this uh, project and this study is in response uh, in a large part to these new requirements that, that the authority is facing in the future and being able to build a facility that can handle the types of materials that will need to be done over the years to come. So it's a very dynamic situation as we move forward in time, uh, being able to project and, and meet these requirements that are, that are imposed on all uh, waste management facilities across the state, not just the authority here. Thanks. Um, so the objective here is to a number of things. One is to reduce the waste that's going into the authority's landfill. That's always been an objective for a long time. It's, it's even more so in the future. Increase the recycling and reuse for the mandates that are out there in the future. Continue providing comprehensive solid waste recovery and disposal services to the jurisdictions that are served by the authority that, that make that up. And then evaluate the different options in the future for solid waste transfer station and the materials recovery center at Salinas, somewhere in the, in the facility that, that can handle these types of materials and provide an efficient uh, facility for the future. And then uh, uh, also integrate in with a local integrated waste recovery system with clean fiber organic recovery system, CFORS, which is what that stands for. And that's a technology that's hopefully able to more recover basically fiber out of the waste stream. This is something a part of the reuse is that's a valuable product. It's something that being recovered that, that is a really big objective of the process. And then also minimize the land use conflicts and environmental impacts uh, in moving forward. 
Um, and there's two slides to this background that goes through many years of, of, and I think many of you know this probably much better than anybody else in the room. But anyway, there's been a long time period from nine, beginning in 1998 of looking at considering a permanent re recycling facility. Um, there's been other pursuits at different locations that the authority has taken a look at and evaluated for whatever reasons, for various reasons that you know, they haven't worked out ideally. Um, 2008 to present, looking at the Sun Street location as, as possibility, and then the city also um, providing some input on that as, as well as, as you know, into, into where they should go. The second slide on this continues on. We're looking at permanent uh, relocation facilities at Work Street. We looked at uh, other areas um, uh, where you could put these uh, different facilities on this. So I won't go into the history on this, but we're kind of at this point here where um, the Sun Street facility that we're in here right now is, is needs either expansion at this location and, and looking at it differently or a combination of, at different locations, but being stagnant and, and reusing is not going to fill the needs of the future. Um, so going forward, we have a number of alternative site locations. Um, <coughs> and these include Harrison Road, Sun Street, Crazy Horse Landfill, Johnson Canyon Landfill, and or using uh, the Monterey facility that already exists. So these could be a combination, as mentioned, the, um, and I think actually that, I think the next slide is actually a location. Well, we haven't got to yet. I'm just going to point out that the sites that I just brought up are actually mapped out in that location there. We have a slide, I think, later on that shows that. Each of these sites <coughs> has a different combination of facility needs and, and uh, abilities. You know, it's the Harrison Road. Um, I won't go again, I won't read, you can read these yourselves on these, but we have the, uh, actually I'll go through the King Fiber Office Recovery System at Harrison Road, Transfer Station, Recycling Center, Household Hazardous Waste, Maintenance Building, and the Office Building. That would all be located here at Harrison Road. This would be a kind of an all comprehensive site. Sun Street offers a Transfer Station, Recycling Center, Hazardous Waste Facility, Maintenance Building, the Crazy Horse Landfill, Transfer Station, Recycling Center, and Hazardous Waste Facility. Johnson Canyon Landfill, on that at Clean Fiber Optics, uh, Clean Fiber and Organics Recovery Center. And then there's a no Salinas facility on this, no new facilities, and most of the material would be trucked off site or, or option would be looked at. So that's the variety that used. This is the map that's uh, on that board over there. It's the same here on this. You can see the locations are rather diverse and they're separated on this. We're here, of course, here at Sun Street, you found yourself here. Crazy Horse Landfill, Harrison Road, the landfill here, the, the uh, Monterey County Landfill, and then Johnson Canyon Landfill down here at the bottom. Um, going through each of the sites, we'll just touch briefly on these. These have both, uh, we'll go through on each of the ones, has an aerial map on that, as well as a kind of a diagram of what would, how it might be designed. This is Harrison Road, right off of 101 at Sailor Road. Um, this is the new interchange that's been recently completed here. So we have uh, an open, basically, uh, previously agricultural field. It's zoned for, um, I'm trying to remember, but it's not, it's not zoned agricultural. It's, it's, what's that? Commercial. Commercial, yes, on that. <coughs> um, surrounded by some uh, residential uses to the north on that, and then Harrison Road and agricultural uses around that, um, on that site. So the next slide shows the preliminary plan that's been laid out. Um, basically, the way this site would work is the truck, it's basically a circular type pattern, which is ideal for these kinds of facilities, where the entrance here is off of Harrison Road. It comes around in a pattern on this. Your scales are at this location. This provides an advantage of lots of queuing area and storage, as it's called, for trucks as they come in. So you can handle it, and then they exit out here and come back out facility and use this um, to access in and out. So it's a, a one single large building on this site. It's also, I'd like to point out that it's set back on this. If the site utilizes a lot of landscaping features out here. Um, there's a berm area that surrounds it. There's landscaping separating it from the residential uses that are to the north uh, location on that. And, um, you know, the site's been designed to be all contained on that. I think the next slide is a map of the traffic patterns that would be on there. This is based on, you know, what's, what's predicted to be used and how this would, would, uh, would
would work. Um, we have the different haulers, and you can see the self haul routes, franchise routes, transfer route. Um, each of those locations are kind of, I, you know, this is how it's thought that it would be used, and this will be uh, some of the assumptions that would be used in the EIR in terms of analyzing the traffic, um, basically how to get uh, trucks in and out, and, uh, and uh, as well as the private users that come to the site. So I'm going to go to the next slide on that. This is the uh, Sun Street location. This is where we are right now. Um, this is, would be an expansion of the uh, existing site here, a reuse of the site here on this. Um, I'll go to the next slide on this to show the layout. Uh, this is a split drawing on here. And I think actually we have one that has it joined together, but this shows the detail on here. Again, you have a, um, let's see if I can put this together here. The uh, entrance of the site comes in and you have a circulation pattern that allows again the queuing of trucks and storage of trucks. And that facilities laid out the main facilities here in this location on that. So it's another layout plan as an option. This is showing the truck routes and the haul routes that would be anticipated to be used to access and come in and out of the site and how it would come in uh, would continue use. And this by the way is because it's an existing site, this is based on existing patterns of, of use right now. So uh, this is not necessarily hypothetical. Okay, this is the Crazy Horse Landfill, which exists. This is in a little more rural of location. This is, again, um, on the northernmost site that's out there, existing landfill. We'll go to the next site right on that. Um, we have a layout here on this. Access comes off of the north here and into the site. We have a circular pattern, again, with a facility main building on this. Again, the same type of pattern on here. we would be able to queue the trucks up on, on, on the site. This would be accessed from, from more of a rural location as opposed to the other, the other um, sites. So you have a longer haul, haul distance to get in there. It's on a rural road. And so it's a little bit different in how it's used. Um, and this, again, is the uh, map of the type of uh, traffic patterns that would be followed. So I'll go ahead to the next slide on that. <coughs> Finally, the Johnson Canyon landfill. Again, this is an aerial photo showing the layout of the parcel on this. This is the Johnson Canyon Road coming in here with Johnson Creek. And then, um, we'll go to the next slide. That's the layout in there. And this is the uh, layout plan for it. So we have the access roads coming in off of here off the Johnson Canyon Road. Comes into the facility. And then you have the whole building itself with all the different units of how to handle the waste. You have your circulation pattern of backing the trucks in and out to this location here. slide on that and this is again the same pattern as be the anticipated traffic patterns that would be used for accessing in and out of the site. Um, oh and finally the landfill, the existing landfill on that. So this one is a site that exists. Uh, we can go to the next slide to show where it is with the traffic patterns that, that uh, access and increase that. These are all the haul routes and the different results. We can also, you know, flash back to these later on if you have questions on these things. Um, okay, so um, I think what, uh, having seen kind of a whirlwind tour of these different sites, they all have kind of uh, some common themes to them. There's commercial public scales and the scale house as you enter the site. This, uh, the material is weighed uh, and accumulated there. We have a transfer station, material recovery station, also <coughs> hazardous waste clean fiber and organics recovery system on that. Then we have admin buildings, maintenance building, and the outdoor areas. So each of these sites, these are kind of the fundamental uh, different mix of, of types of needs for each of the locations that we have there, but these are common things that are needed for the operation, basic operation of the facility. Go to the next slide. Uh, these are the alternative scenarios, and we have this in the materials that are handed out. There's quite a bit of detail on each of these, but you'll notice we have scenario one, two, and I won't go to the slide yet, but there's other three, four, five. And on this has the mix of uses and operations that would take place there. And then you have on the far column the proposed location. So on each of these, when you look at this table, it provides you the types of uses at each for each scenario, scenario one, with a mix of types of uses, and then you have the location for a reference on that just to read this table. So I won't go into the detail, it's here and it's in the handouts that we have and available. 
Scenario two is the transfer station, and you'll notice it has a different mix of uses on the other side, a mix, mix of uh, operating locations on that, and how it will be handled as, as to that blend of operations. So on the next slide, we have the other three alternatives. <coughs> Clean Fiber and Organic Recovery Center on alternative three. Again, if you go over to the far column, it shows you the locations and then the amount of waste that be handled. This is the no Salinas facility, which would be nothing's happening in Salinas itself. It gives the option of, of not handling anything at the present location or in the city on that and how it would be done. And then we have the CEQA alternative of the no project, which would just be really a minor expansion, minor change to the Sun Street uh, facility on that and all the operations that pretty much are handling, handling right now and into the future. Uh, well, go ahead. Question. The, is the Monterey Regional Waste Management District the, the uh, facility in Marina, is that still called the Monterey Bay uh, Environmental Park? I don't. Yes, I yes it is, and it houses both the, the landfill and their solid waste operations and the wastewater <coughs> plant and serves. trucks are still coming from Santa Cruz utilizing that. I mean, it's, it's a draw from all over the Monterey Bay area. Yeah, my understanding is, yes, they are still importing waste from Santa Cruz County cities, but the majority of their waste is coming from uh, Santa Clara County. From uh, I see their their uh, partnership with Green Waste Recovery has a large materials recovery facility. It's kind of a big central location. They do a lot. They do a lot. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Just some clarification. Yeah. Okay. No problem. Um, this is a laundry list of obviously the environmental topics we have. Um, I just put these up there. These, this is again. I'll go back to reminder. This is a scoping meeting for input as to what goes into the environmental document. We're planning already to address each of these topics that's listed up here, and these are obviously broad topics. These are headings of the chapters that will be in the document itself. Um, you know, we're interested in input on anything and everything that you know you have input on that. But we're really focused on what goes into this environmental impact report and the environmental impact analysis that we'll be doing. That's really the purpose of the meeting is to gather your input into this after you see some of these facilities, raise some of the questions. What do you think is, needs to be addressed? What's in addition to what we're looking at? Obviously, this is just the headings again. We'll be going into quite a bit of detail in the environmental impact report when, it, when it's put out for draft review. Go to the next slide on that. Um, we also have, as part of the project, the environmental document will support of ultimately getting regulatory permits and approvals from various agencies. These are also <coughs> listed in the handouts that we have, and I won't go through them all, but we have various regulatory authorities and permits, as all of you are very aware of, and some of you are uh, responsible for, that, we, that the project will have to meet. The environmental document intent is to provide the information that will be the foundation of those permits ultimately on that. So again, we're addressing not only the input from everybody here and the agencies that come in, but as well as the material that needs to be used ultimately to move forward with any permits or authorizations that are needed by the project. Yeah. So the project has basically the environmental impact report, as you know, serves many functions on that. So that will, I think, move into a question and answer period on this. And what we'll do is, um, you know, it's an informed, this is kind of a formal, informal situation. We don't have a huge crowd, so I think we can really kind of get into individual questions that you have and discuss those. <coughs> and we'll write down some of the pertinent factors that go into that. I'd also like to encourage that out of this meeting, if you're able to provide us written comments, that's very helpful. We'll, we'll of course, report, you know, note down what we hear today. But I'd encourage you as well to write in with a written comment. Written comments will be handled as well as any verbal comments coming today. We'll assemble that. We use that to help us make sure that we're addressing the concerns and that we haven't missed something or that we're addressing really what's, what's out there on that so that we can go forward with our environmental document. Later on, I might point out that you probably most of you are aware of with the environmental process, there'll be a draft environmental impact report that's issued for public and agency review. That'll be put out for the mandatory you know, review period. There'll be another opportunity for comment at that stage, and then we'll address every comment that comes in at that point too. So this is the first step in the public review and agency review stage. We appreciate any comments now that help us guide that. There'll be other opportunities in the future, so see you won't, you won't miss.
this out. Maybe, maybe you could give us a little bit of background on your company and how long you've been preparing environmental impact reports, where you're from, do you specialize in, in transfer stations, or you know, a little bit of background, so, and how much knowledge do you have about Monterey County? Yeah, okay. I mean, I mean I, and on, EIR is often only as good as its authors and, yeah. and the information that they get. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. So maybe Fair you enough. share with us a little bit about Yeah. About Sorry, Jim, before, or Jeff, before you start, could, could, when you ask a question, could you also identify yourself? Sure, Frank so Weaver, W-E-A-V-E-R. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay. You're welcome. All right, with uh, your uh, uh, property owner nearby. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. I wasn't sure if you were the uh, company or agency. No. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, my name again is Jeff Zimmerman. I'm with the company uh, AECOM. So I've been in the business of doing environmental impact reports for over 30 years. In fact, it's approaching 35 years, I think, now. So I've done quite a bit. Not all in this business. A lot of transportation type stuff is what I've, I've done a lot of. But I've done other projects that have dealt with waste management, waste transfer, how handling, you know, different types of waste, anywhere from hazardous, you know, and I'm talking about myself now, of course. Yeah. Anywhere dealing from hazardous waste facilities, on industrial facilities type of stuff, at oil refineries, that kind of thing, all the way to commercial facilities um, that have handled, you know, for example, um, uh, uh, construction and debris type uh, re reuse, collection of that, evaluation of those in communities, as, as well as other types of projects on that. Um, so I've had a, not a wide background on that. Um, in terms of the Central Valley area, this area, I have not done a project that's been directly in Salinas. So yeah, I'm not from, I'm, but we work out, our company is, uh, I work out of the Oakland, our Oakland office on that, right. and that so Bay Area. So yeah, I'm not a, I'm not a native <laughs> to, the, okay. to this particular area, but I am a native of the Bay Area. So, right. so I think that, that answers your question on that. Yeah. Okay. I have some comments too. Okay. And I, other people may have some questions too. I don't okay. Know. Well, we can we can move around the room if you like. So, understand. if you could go to the CEQA study scenarios, the table that you had early on. Oh, the list of uh, topics. Uh, scenarios. Oh, scenarios. scenarios. Sorry. Yeah. This one. Or this no, one. keep going. There. Yeah. Uh, Gary Peters and Susan Salinas. Okay. Uh, so. So I look at if I go down to alternative four, so the no Salinas uh, uh, facility, the, the bullet point under number four that says existing Sun Street facility closes with authority staff reductions, that is not in the written document. What you're showing is different than what was distributed. You're saying this line is different. It is. I've got my original distributed right here, and uh, it says existing facility would be closed, but it says nothing about reduction in staff. And sort of my sort of my issue with this is perhaps it's the title, uh, because there's a number of no Salina scenarios. If this if the um, transfer station were to relocate outside of Salinas, those would be no Salinas facilities either. Um, okay. and might have different impacts yeah. than what you're listing there. This is the direct haul alternative, I believe, uh, although that is different than the document I'm holding in my hand as well, where it says no Salinas facility, and here my document says direct haul to MRWND. So. Okay. Well, I think that, just, just as a clarification on the Salinas, it should say no Salinas area facilities, because we are refer to these as the Salinas I just, This is the document you sent me, the uh, registered it. mail and everything, so no, I just was clarifying what you're saying. concerned that we have consistency on the distribution. So. Okay. So Gary, was your question about staffing or about location or about both inconsistencies? Well, the, the inconsistencies are the, between the printed and what we're seeing here, which, which matters. No, I'm not, I'm not questioning whether okay, it's so no, staffing my or location. Point, location my or comment what? is that the way this is written with no Salinas facility, there are a number of scenarios that include a no Salinas facility. Um, and not just one. With the direct haul, when that's added on, it makes more sense. Cool. Yeah. And the, the no project, we, 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 if it was relocated to the marina landfill, 
that would require some kind of an expansion of arena and probably more staffing, one would think. But that would also be a no salinas uh, option. Um, yeah, that that's <coughs> true under, there's different scenarios. I see. Um, the scenario that came out of the city, manager, city manager's report uh, would not require, require almost no increase in staffing because it would simply send it all there and landfill. Now, under the scenarios well, they where... they have a recycling center, too. But we're, we're referring to a, a study that sort of has driven these scenarios so that it was put out by the city manager, the city manager's group, a couple of years ago. Um, and so there are options underneath that study, one of which would be everything shuts down, everything goes to the landfill, there's some potential cost savings. Uh, the other scenarios, which are also covered under this, would include some level of processing, all part, those are all things that would be subject to some future negotiation between the agencies. But ultimately, we're looking at the worst case scenario uh, for them, which is simply moving all the material there. And then, um, what happens once it's there, they already have the entitlements for that, whether it's to landfill it or to run it through a process. And so the secondary question is, is being analyzed as well, but that's driven more around the cost, the cost of doing advanced processing versus the cost of just simply uh, continuing. Hi, I'm Jim Sandoval, City of Salinas. Um, I'm new to the city and, and getting my bearings here, but uh, one question uh, I have about number four, I guess, is, well, my question initially was, it, it has a regional approach to waste management, meaning 75% diversion, been talked about with uh, Monterey Regional and Salinas Valley, and, you know, is, is option four that regional approach, or have there been other alternatives looked at in terms of diverting waste for the entire county? Um, well, the simple answer is talks have been ongoing and are continuing to ongo. Uh, the district is in the process of, of transitioning with a new system and trying to, their costs are evolving, so part of this is going to be an evolving discussion between the agencies over the course of the next. 6-12 months as they put their system in place and, and what the final cost impacts would be or benefits associated with some collaborative effort. Um, so. Was your question a question of, of logistics or, or merging the two? I'm just wondering if the five alternatives, um, you know, cover, you know, look at it through a regional lens. Uh, they have. They, they all actually do because even under the, uh, the advanced systems or the C or, or use of the uh, clean fiber organics recovery system, we're also talking about uh, reciprocity, the possibility of a system that actually has a collective better benefit than either project by themselves. So the district's project is their, their system is more focused on uh, recovery of recyclables and packaging for markets. Conventional recycling markets. The C4 system is designed more on processing mixed waste that's already going to landfill. So they're not necessarily competing technologies, though there's some overlap in terms of the component of the waste stream that each system would get. Collectively, they're they're actually focusing more on one waste stream or another. So the C4 system is focused more on wet residential commercial garbage. The districts is more on dry recoverable materials and single stream recycling sort of outside of the scope of the study for us. So there's a there's a there's a both a collective discussion and, and a focused discussion on whether things can just go to the district or maybe stay the course this agency has been on for a while. So so what was the language you used on reciprocity? Shared shared uh, shared use of, of process technology. But I don't see that in these alternatives. Uh, it's not there's a thousand hybrids here. These are all looking at each project in its worst case scenario. And ultimately, at the end, you can mix and match uh, because you've looked, uh, from an environmental perspective, you've looked at the worst case scenario, which is doing one of the projects. But for instance, if the district, if we were to send materials to the district, uh, maybe just construction demolition material, which is something we've been interested in, uh, that is a lesser impact than sending everything 
So under the EIR structure, we've looked at the worst case scenario, using that that scenario to a lesser degree, you know, sending 25% of our waste tank instead of 50 or 60 uh, would be covered. So again, I can come up, you can sit down and look at a lot of different scenarios, but this reflects the four worst case scenarios and then there can be hybrids looking at, at a combination of things under each one of those options. I think we have an online question that oh, Stephanie's yeah. um, oh. looking at. So if we want to you want to start with the first one? Okay. Is that the or is um, that was Jim? <coughs> okay. And Jeff had Jeff on who's online had a question. So we could read the questions for so Possible to EOMA a copy of the slide showing traffic route. So in the initial thing, in the initial um, documents that we sent out, we didn't include the traffic route. Mm -hmm. So we can um, we can get people's emails and then email those out. So we can send them yeah. the slides. Yeah. 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 We can send the whole presentation again with the uh, showing the traffic routes. Okay. And then I think he had another question. So the statement, all self callers directed to MRWMD for public drop-off services would seem not to include the option the public has to utilize the Madison Lane transfer station. Can this be amended to re redirect it to Madison Lane transfer station or MRWMD? Um, our board has already looked at the transfer station as a system component twice, and that option has been taken off the table for um, a number of issues. So at this point, um, we are not considering the Madison Lane transfer station as a future component. Um, Even so though it I, serves that purpose now. It serves that purpose now, but this would redirect additional traffic to that facility. So we would have to engage those neighbors make sure they're aware of it based on the past efforts of looking at that site. Um, you know, the, there are other concerns there as well because cell haulers also include large vehicles, large trucks. It's not just our garbage trucks that we can control their traffic. We can't control the large uh, commercial business that wants to haul their own material. So to do that would be creating another impact in a new location. So at this point, because our board has uh, eliminated Madison Lane because it is a privately owned facility and there is no guarantee that that facility will stay open going forward. So, Wasn't Madison Lane in a public meeting turned down by the city of Salinas? Well no, the whole, the whole issue is there was, there, was a, there was an effort to look at that site a second time. We looked at it early on in the agency's, uh, uh, agency's history. And in both cases, there were there were concerns over it. Uh, the first time around was cost, uh, cost to either contract for it or cost to buy it and have it be taken over as a public agency. So in that case, it, it failed for a couple of different reasons. Uh, the second time around, uh, there was an attempt to look at that. Um, the issue with Madison Lane is sort of twofold. One is there's only one way in and out of that facility, and it's through a Baranda community. So there's not a there's not an alternative entrance and exit that, that avoids all these all this traffic driving through a neighborhood. Um, and so that's one of the big issues with that site. The solution would have been to build an alternate entrance to that uh, Baranda area that would allow commercial businesses, not just the transfer station, but other businesses, to ingress and egress the property uh, through a southern access that would connect to Davis Road. The unfortunate part of that is the only way when cars access Davis Road, they're accessing an impacted roadway. Most of those vehicles will likely head towards the freeway, towards an impacted intersection that's part of the problem. And, and in front, to and from uh, that facility in front of a uh, fairly new elementary school. So having considered all those things, even the alternate exit would present some impact issues of just shifting it from Veranda to the North Davis with Davis Road residents and businesses <coughs> and into impacted. So for, for those reasons alone, I mean, we, we've not entertained adding, data, adding Madison Lane as a component unit of our system. 
doesn't mean that as long as there are people can't use it. But if we make it part of our project, then we have to go and engage that community and start having these discussions we've had twice before. And so unless the board wants to change its mind on this one, I think now uh, we are not considering uh, Madison Lane as a component. We've always thought it was a fine idea. To a what? A fine idea for them to relocate at Madison Lane. Mike, will that be brought no. up? No. <laughs> will that be brought up in the No, I heard in a public no. meeting. Sorry. The EIR is not going to have a traffic study on the Madison Lane and analysis of why Madison Lane wasn't yeah, we've utilized already, we've and the history there. of the animosity between this this agency and Madison Lane. We've had, it we've, might be we've, helpful. We've studied it twice. We have an EIR actually looked at Madison Lane originally. So that work's actually already been done. It might be referenced in this EIR. Yeah, it's, we can bring up background. Yeah, it would be a good thing. Sure. Or as an, as an alternative. But we weren't, we weren't going to go further deeper into the studies. We have some, we have background. Yeah. We can reference we can the last, our 2002. <coughs> I have some comments. When you're okay. ready, sure. I prepared a letter for you. Okay, great. This is coming from the perspective of my wife and I as being property owners nearby here. Okay. Nearby? On Griffin Street. Okay. <coughs> which is the access to here. Uh, Dear Salinas Valley Solid Waste Authority, my wife and I are long-term property owners on Griffin Street. We recall when the Sun Street Transfer Station was being proposed. We followed up on this proposal and were told that if it was to be located on Sun Street, it would be a temporary location. We expressed concerns regarding additional traffic on Griffin Street to and from the Sun Street Transfer slash Recycle Station. We were told that the large garbage trucks would not be using Griffin Street for access. However, the garbage trucks regularly do use Griffin Street for access to Sun Street. Significant impacts have resulted. We request that the following impacts at the current Sun Street location be analyzed in EIR. One, wear and tear on the neighboring streets from heavy trucks. Two, inability to safely park on the two-lane Griffin Street curbside parking because of the size of the large trucks heading to Sun Street. Three, the noise generated by large garbage trucks in the commercial small business area that includes Griffin and Commission Streets, among others. Four, dust, lots of dust, much of it coming from the Sun Street Transfer Recycle Station. Five, litter, more litter in the area from accidentally blowing out of the garbage trucks. Six, Sun Street Transfer Station and Recycle is a magnet for the homeless. The area is also home to street prostitutes. This necessitates additional police patrols and city expense. Seven, there are burglaries of recycled items from neighboring businesses. Our business has been broken into twice. These businesses are broken into at night. There are damage to buildings and fences. Eight, because of its location, the Sun Street Transfer Station and Recycle has become a public nuisance. Signed, Mike Weaver. This is for you. Okay, thank you. Okay. You, Mr. Matthews, and this is for the city of Salinas. Thank you. You're welcome. That's all I have to say. Okay. That's great. Thank you. I'd like to speak to number five briefly. I think that uh, minor expansion is a subjective phrase, and I'm not sure what that means. And where is the line drawn on what's a mill project and what is a changed project? I'm sure CEQA has very specific language about that, but our concern is very much is the idea of it staying while changing has to be very, very clearly understood. The authority already has a mitigated neck deck that would provide for expansion of this facility to a modern and closed transfer station. So that already exists. Um, so this, this work really is supplemental to that in terms of re-looking at the traffic and other environmental conditions that were done so 607 when the uh, original mitigating neck deck, neck deck was approved. So um, right now, minor expansion can include anything from simply putting a, a tensile fabric building or some kind of building over the tipping area to mitigate dust and litter uh, to you know, something very similar to what we're showing here, which is a full-scale uh, modern facility. Uh, well, it so doesn't do anything to address could increase an excessive capacity based on the how could you change it? Because it, 
Is it capacity a big issue here capacity. in terms of the permit? Well, the, the, the original uh, Michigan Make deck uh, anticipated, I want to say, the 12 or 1,500 tons per day max capacity, so it allowed for growth and accommodate city growth. Um, and so a modern design facility like the one you saw on the drawing would accommodate significantly larger volumes. But that's those more materials could be moved in and out very quickly. And I just argue that's probably more than a minor modification if you're into structures and facilities. And that, that I would just ask whether that really <coughs> still equates to a no project. Well, it does equate to a no project. So when I say minor improvements, um, it could be some very simple things that just mitigate existing conditions. So it could be the same facility as it stands today, but you put a cover over the building. So minor would be simply existing facility uh, within the structure that was already anticipated when we did the original sequel work in 2006. So that can include a lot of minor modifications, but the full-scale facility we are reevaluating, and that is one of the scenarios here. The transfer station would anticipate, again, we're looking at what would a full-scale facility look like. This would be simply, what can we do here within the structure of that sequel document to make the facility better, make it a better neighbor, but also make it operate more efficiently. So those would be minor. Not minor. And minor probably is not the right word. But it would be modifications to improve, improve the usage of the facility. Yes, I guess I'll go next. Yeah. Uh, Mohammed Qureshi, County of Monterey Resource Management Agency. Um, since we're talking scope, we'll be very blunt. We are extremely concerned that three <coughs> of the facilities listed involve extensive use of county roads, and many of them are, um, to put it kindly, in disrepair. And you're proposing to add a significant amount of truck trips to those roads, so we would expect that the traffic, the transportation and traffic element would have a very detailed analysis of uh, axle loads on those roads and a very detailed assessment of the existing uh, infrastructure of the roads and their ability to take additional traffic. So, as I said, I would expect a, good, a great deal of information on traffic index and I would expect to see a lot of information on the existing um, roadway structure and substructure and then what would be an appropriate level of in improvement to the roads needed in order to sustain that amount of tra traffic. Yeah, fair enough. Um, yeah, it's kind of an engineering analysis uh, uh, on a big scale, so we'd, we'd have to do what we could at, at an environmental stage. But well, but it I, is. I understand that. But it's a significant impact, and yeah, I don't think you can yeah. not do a somewhat of an analysis. To yeah. gloss over that would be a very great disservice. Okay. And when you said the three, the three scenarios, which ones do you mean? Well, specific? you're talking about three potential facilities that go, I said three facilities. Yeah, I'm because they go which in, options you're referencing. Because they're going into multiple scenarios. You've got Crazy Horse, you've got the Johnson, and the Harrison Road sites are all going to involve part of their routes or an extensive part of their route using county maintained roads. County roads. And it doesn't, in, then in your mind, it doesn't include going over the Monterey Regional? Well, it does to some degree, but that's already also probably part of your existing route. So it's most of that, most of that transfer, yeah. at least from the, the controlled the, heavy traffic is on Caltrans, all on Caltrans. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the routes you showed on your earlier screens for the, for the Monterey uh, facility did not really incorporate a lot of county maintained routes. It showed mostly traffic on Highway 1 with just a little bit near Castorville. And so I understand that perhaps, you know, unless those routes are wrong, <laughs> I understand why those wouldn't come up. But clearly, when you talk about the Johnson Canyon facility, we already know you're using at least Gloria, Iverson, and I think there's a third road. I apologize, I'm new to the- Johnson? Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah, new to the- Gloria well, and Iverson have been, were added to the TAMC, yes. new TAMC money, so we're, we've been, actually been waiting out sitting on two and a half million dollars of mitigation well, money to help, right. help with that. But again, uh, the point is that and Harrison Road's another one that is 
also a county road up to a certain point, and then yes, you're showing most of it going on solo over your one on one, but still, again, I think you have to be cognizant that that's going to be a big issue for any of your scenarios because you're talking about some heavy duty trucks. I mean, who's ever roads, whether it's the cities or ours, we're all going to be extremely concerned about the amount of uh, you know life of pavement that you chew up with that traffic. Right. And so that's the kind of analysis we would hope would be done. Yeah. It's what analysis does the county um, does the county must have must have assessments, pavement quality um, assessments for most of these roads because they're made for most of them are all Yes, but unfortunately when it comes to truck traffic, that isn't going to help you because the assessments we have are going to be pavement index values, which are not related back to truck traffic or traffic index. What needs to be done is calculation of a traffic index and more specifically of equivalent single axle loads for the heavy vehicles you're going to go through and a comparison with what the life of the pavement is or needs to be given the amount of projected truck traffic. Does that exist for the regional Monterey Regional Waste Management District? I am not able to answer that question. I do not know. <laughs> good question. I mean, it's a good issue in terms of impact. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think I understand the question. I'm, I'm thinking about how we address that. It's not a question. <laughs> it's a comment. I'm yeah, not I'm asking a comment. question. I understand that that's what is that's not captured right now. But I'm, what I'm saying is. Yeah. This is a scoping meeting. I'm right. suggesting what needs to be part of the traffic traffic yeah. element scope. We asked for it, yeah, so. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, um, following up to my last question, uh, sounds like the proposal is for wet waste to come more towards Salinas and dry waste more towards Monterey Regional. Um, have you guys looked at options at the water treat wastewater treatment plant for dye district capacity for your food waste? No. The district currently has um, uh, some digester capacity that is specific for food waste management. So uh, I, right now the Salinas um, food waste that's being collected on our, uh, by our hauler here in Salinas is taking that to them. Uh, but their, uh, my understanding right now is there's not that excess capacity and there has not been any discussions. The district though has installed their own food waste specific digestion system. And so to expand that more food waste would require an investment. So right now the first unit they got was predominantly paid by outside sources. It's a demonstration unit, but it's been able to serve about 5,000 tons a year of food waste processing, which is pretty significant. But to really expand it would require an investment by the district and or um, whoever the user to my knowledge, they haven't had, I don't know if they've had any real discussions with the wastewater plant mm -hmm. about excess digestion capacity. I'm not familiar with that. Is the expansion of that food waste unit a possibility for you all? Um, to your, uh, well, it really depends on the direction we go. Um, right now, we're focusing more on composting to deal with uh, organics and food waste. Uh, composting has a higher greenhouse gas value in terms of greenhouse gas reduction. So. Our first focus is on composting and, and, and being able to deal with um, the low-hanging fruit. But concentrated food waste loads, uh, like, like the one we're collecting in Salinas, makes a lot of sense to continue to go to the digester. And, and I think in the, in the long run, it makes more sense for the district because they have an end user next door, a wastewater plant, who they're feeding the current uh, energy from that they're using and making methane in. So food waste could continue to go to them, but um, we're an ag community. Composting has a much higher value for us in, in recovery methodology for the other organics, you know, the grain waste and, uh, you know, and potentially commingled grain waste and food waste from residents, but that add, doesn't add a huge volume of food waste to the system. The third option, which is the other one that we've really been talking about in our agency for a lot of years, has really been the, um, the global organic system, because that system universally collects and captures all the organic material. <coughs> the process of all the wet waste. So people aren't changing their habits, which is an unfortunate challenge in our industry. Uh, having a system that deals with it for the residents, that deals with it for people that don't want to participate in a separation system because a lot of people are very hesitant to do that. Uh, that solves the problem in an easier way uh, than having a separate collection system. But 
system, it then separates mechanically out the constituents, and the, the uh, solubilized, it's kind of like making consummate. You take the food waste and you put it into the 150 degree water while you're washing the fiber, and then you take that and put it into the anaerobic digester, and you create enough uh, 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 energy to run the entire system. So it's energy self-sufficient without having to separate the cost or the energy and efficiency <coughs> from separating out the organic waste. And so you're completely energy self-sufficient for the entire system and you have uh, energy left over to sell into the commercial marketplace, whatever that means. You can sell it as biogas or electricity, whatever the case may be. But the, key is not for users or for separate trucks and separate bins, which are separate costs and separate impacts on roads. You don't have to separate that out that uh, organic wet fraction. Mm -hmm. And you can use it in the integrated system to be completely energy self-sufficient, which is why the entire cost structure is so much lower that you're not having to buy energy to run the system. Did that help you clarify Sorry, a little bit? Patrick had mentioned something about composting being kind of the highest and best use for food waste. And so well, I think currently, if you look at trying to keep the wet fraction out of landfills, because that's part of the problem, then the question is, number one, how do you separate it out? And number two, what do you do with it? And right now you can use composting law as an oil amendment, or you can use that wet fraction in some way, shape, or form to create electricity. And so it's a question of the, of the uh, of costs and environmental impacts of that approach versus what kind of revenues you might to mitigate your costs, then looking at that, uh, how it relates to our system in terms of not having to separate out, not having the added environmental impacts uh, of extra bins and extra trucks, and being energy self-sufficient in the production of the clean fiber and its value. Will the EIR address the energy neutrality and have an energy balance? Yeah. Yeah. I, th um, <clears throat> I thought it said something about importing natural gas to supplement energy for the plant. And then if you yeah, I'm trying to remember what we said on that, but we, we could look at that on that in terms of the energy balance, which mm -hmm. we're basically looking at going in and going out. So what you know whether to supplement some of the existing because I guess you have to supplement it it's not totally self sufficient. Well it depends. I mean it, yeah. you know the I mean, right now our focus is on, and I, and I use the word collectively organic, which is green waste, which is the predominant, the predominant feedstock material that we're already dealing with, and that is continuing to be a compost focus area uh, because it has a better value. Food waste becomes a much more complex discussion because you have to get it out of the waste stream, and then you have to handle it. And it's not quite as easy to handle, so composting is, is clearly one way to go. C4 system, but it, but if, if you go with uh, composting or source separation for anaerobic digestion, direct digestion, it requires a collection system. It has to be a way to collect that material and that has its own set of impacts versus a system that um, it's in essence a byproduct of the process. That organic fraction when you 
clean the fiber, you're pulling that organic, flavorized organic fraction out of the fiber and then you clean the wastewater so you're not having to have a huge water demand or a discharge demand and making electricity out of it. So food waste is a tough one. And it's the one we're all challenged with right now is how do we deal with it. And the stuff we're doing in Slice right now is a little hanging fruit. Those are restaurants that are producing large volumes of food waste. As long as you continually train the turnover staff, you can uh, separate that material. But it's not a, it's a very small, small piece. Uh, it's it. also concentrated, so it means it's easy to pick up and cheaper. Well, it's, not as, it's not, yeah. <coughs> I mean, relative to if you're doing it from a house to house or apartment to apartment. Easier said than done because yeah. it's actually getting the businesses to separate it correctly is the right. bigger challenge. But when we get to the householders, small generators of organic material, that's the challenge. That either requires a very more labor and energy intensive collection system to sort out a small amount of material, or you create a use a system like, like the C4 system that can actually just recover it and embed it in the garbage. You don't have to change you don't have to have social change. You don't have to change people's um, habits. So that is sort of a balancing act, you know, we're hoping that you know the data that comes out of this, the greenhouse gas benefits in particular for all the scenarios, we sort of play that play that out to a point where we have some data that we can lean on a little bit in terms of helping make that right decision. Well, um, I would say it's probably the last last call for people on the <coughs> website if you have any additional questions. Uh, we'll wait a few more minutes, see if anybody else has any additional comments or questions they want to raise. Um, but as always, your comments and questions, written or otherwise, can come into the agency or, or to ECOM directly over the, uh, the next uh, 30, 29 days. Um, uh, the comment period is closing. We're keeping it open a little bit longer this time because we're going to be having public meetings as well. So we'll be accepting comments through uh, May 31st. Anybody in the audience have a question? That's a, a, a comment. Um, just around odor control. Um, I've worked in the waste industry for 25 or 30 years myself. And um, I, I understand how, you know, controlling odor in facilities is a challenge, uh, especially when it's concentrated organics. And so, um, on your uh, two autoclave sites, um, you have the <coughs> autoclave facility and the bioethane facility. They're, they're kind of separate, separated by pavement. I'm, What's the plan to transfer the organics from one building to the other without creating um, a lot of odor? Sure, and, that's a great question. And this is a comment. I mean, you're not answer now, or, or, you, or you can. No, um, it's if it's okay. And then along with that, uh, you know, will you have negative pressure buildings with double entrances and you know, double, uh, just to kind of keep the odor inside, um, especially? on the solid road side or Harrison Road side where it's closer sure. to um, businesses. The um, Duke Bascom Global Organics Energy. So the uh, when the uh, material goes in, it's fed into the autoclave just off the floor, transfer station floor. No separate, I mean you might take out an in, uh, uh, a um, battery or a long piece of wood so you don't mess up the conveyor. You don't have to break sacks, plastic sacks, or anything like that. It just takes the whole thing. Cooks it for about 45 minutes at a low heat. Um, and then when you uh, open the vessel, you'd want to uh, contain the uh, odors at that point. The material goes over trommels and screens. Then it goes into the washing tanks. Uh, and then the washing tank after that process, which is again is a low heat, 150 <coughs> degrees, uh, it would go by pipe uh, into the anaerobic digester, and then you would extract out the uh, uh,
cleaned fiber and uh, you would um, dry uh, that fiber uh, down to 20% uh, uh, or so or so moisture content, so wet lap. So if you saw it, it looked like you know a giant piece of paper that was reasonably dry, but it's got about 20% water content to it. Then that would go off. There are three container board mills within two hours of here, and just be driven up there by truck. But the direct answer to your question is that the the, the uh, uh, liquid would go into the anaerobic digesters by so close. Closed pipe. It's pipe from one building to the next. Yeah. And organics is basically in the wash water. So the wash water is piped over. And it's a trickling filter style uh, high rate anaerobic digester. So very similar to what we had seen in the wastewater pipe that's treated uh, primary and secondary sludges. The anaerobic digester is the water treatment plant. Right. And therefore there is no dirty water discharge. Uh, and then you recircle the water uh, back through. Uh, the system uh, so that there's very little uh, uh, additional water. Okay. That answer your question? Yeah, I think so. And then are, are the buildings, are there plans for those to be sealed in a way that that's control the def others? Definitely, definitely at the top of the list of mitigation issues that Absolutely. have to be in design is, is negative, negative pressure buildings. You know. Specifically, the only real odor that comes off the autoclave is at the point of after you cook the material and you open the autoclave, there is a there is a, a brief release of steam as it's cooling off. And so there'll have to be some kind of a hood, probably a hood system, biofilter for treatment of that, direct treatment of that, um, that air discharge, and then probably some type of a negative uh, pressure building structure within the, the areas where the odors will be occurring. Um, the biofilter system is closed loop, so that, that system. Completely contained releases, but the building itself and the processing will likely be similar generation inside the building. Any other questions? Yeah, Jim. Everybody for participating today. And again, the uh, comment period uh, extends through May 31st. So, anybody listening online that has additional comments, please feel free to submit those uh, in writing to our agency. And we look forward to collaborating with everybody in the process as we go forward. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you.